And at this point, I had no idea what a product manager was. And she was explaining to us what a product manager did. And she pulled up this infographic that basically had kind of roughly equal splits between technology, design, communication, and business. I just had this like light bulb moment that I was like, that's what I want to do. From that day to my first day as a product manager was a two-year process. Welcome back to Job Math, the podcast for only the most fabulous Gen Z professionals. I'm Dale. And I'm Lisa. This podcast is for you if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want. Don't forget to follow and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube. And follow us on TikTok and Instagram. And you can also find free resources on how to improve your career, for example, resume templates and guides or tips on how to get a pay rise by visiting www.careerbadger.io. Or even better, download the Career Badger app for iPhone and chat live with our resident career coach, Lisa. Lisa, who are we talking to today? Our esteemed guest today is a product manager who has geniusly and proactively managed their career from the world of recruiting into the SaaS and technology industry. Someone who has not yet been there, seen it and done it all, but we know has a very exciting career ahead. So we are joined by our guest, Edmund, and will you please introduce yourself? Lovely, lovely to be on, Lisa and Dale. I've really been enjoying listening to the episode so far. I'm Edmund, I'm originally from the UK. I grew up in London and in 2019 moved to New York. Uh, I'm a product manager at Series B SaaS startup called Omnipresent. Um, we do global employment, so I get to work with colleagues from, from all over the world. But in a previous life, I was a tech recruiter. And so I'd be really keen to dive into tactics and to be really tactical and specific about pivoting your career. If you find yourself in your early career and not doing something you love as your first job, how can you move into something that you do find fulfilling after that? Really looking forward to hear that story. Before we do that, maybe just explain a little bit about uh, the role of a product manager and in a SaaS business. I won't belabor the distinction between project manager and product manager because I think Jason Ling handled that in great depth and with great <laughs> elegance in a, in a previous episode. So just go listen to that. I think the misconception that is, that is common that's really important to get out there, product Product managers aren't managers of people, which is an easy misconception to make because it has manager in the title. The management of product management is ownership over a product that you're building. In the case of a SaaS business, a piece of software. And fundamentally, your job as a product manager is to protect your team from building something cool but useless. Because that's the default. When you get a bunch of smart, excitable people in a room together, the default is to build something as soon as possible. And most things that you build, if you don't go talk to users first, are cool because the people building them are smart, but useless because they don't actually solve a problem in the world. Dale's laughing here because, you know, he's, uh, he's a veteran in product management. So I'm sure he's got some, some stories of this he could, he, he could exchange as well. But fundamentally, that's what I view the role, role of a product manager to, do, to, to be. You are responsible for the team making sure that they're building something that has value but you do that by and I, we can get into this more by cultivating a culture where the team can make decisions you are not telling them what to do because you are not their manager even though you've got manager in the title and the team here i should be specific is a team of software engineers plus a designer when you're actually imagining the core of a product's team we talk about the product trio which is a product manager a designer and a software engineer but in practice, there's going to be more than one software engineer in your team. So you are in the minority in your team, but you have an oversized responsibility to make sure that what is being built genuinely solves the problem for your customers. Cool. And then maybe maybe break that out. You talked about speaking to users. What are the other sort of skills or techniques or methodologies that you're, you're using in a, in a product management role then? So primarily, you are aiming to give context to your team about why you're building something. And there's multiple different ways you can arrive at that. There's one really bad way you can arrive at that, which is I'm doing it because my boss told me to build it. Now, again, that might be a default if you don't push back. Um, but the reason that's not a good idea is because your boss absolutely hasn't talked to the users. And what I love about product management, I think 
you might know that this is a field that you'd find interesting, is that done right, it's an idea meritocracy. It's not about the opinion of the highest paid person. It's really about the need of the customer. And where it differs from something like customer support or some kind of service organization is if you're in customer support and your customer tells you about a problem, your goal is to literally give them the solution they're asking for, to just take like a waiter, like take an order and go and do the thing. But if you do that in software, you end up with a horrible Frankenstein's monster of a product that solves lots of little jobs in terrible ways and doesn't actually solve the core problem. And when you talk to your users, they aren't experts in designing software. In most cases, maybe if you work at Figma, that's, that's different, right? And then you probably have different problems that your users have inside baseball and that they can't get out of their own heads when they're giving you feedback. So good luck if you're building software for product managers or designers, then you've got a different set of problems. But in most cases, you're not, right? And what they literally ask for might not be the right solution. And something I really like is there's an analogous quote about this when it comes to writing. So my wife's a writer, and so I look a lot of content about writing. And um, Neil Gaiman says, when someone reads your draft and they tell you, I don't like X or Y about it, they're right. There's something broken that you need to fix. When they tell you how to fix it and say, oh, I think you should write it so he does X, Y, Z instead of this, they're wrong. It's a terrible idea. Don't do it. And so the user, in this case, the reader and in the writing analogy, but in the case of software, the customer paying for your software, when they tell you about a problem, they're right. You need to listen to it. When they tell you how to fix it, they're probably wrong because their job is not to design scalable software that works for all your customers. Their job is just to try and solve their own problem. And the kind of apocryphal Henry Ford quote is, if I'd asked people what they wanted, I they would have said faster horses. And that's the same idea. Where product management really, where you add value is by being high empathy, ingesting this feedback from your users but having the discipline to make sure that what you build is genuinely solving a problem for all of them, not on a one by case by case basis, just literally building what someone tells you to build. Fantastic answer, Edwin. Thank you. That's um, yeah, some lovely metaphors, some great quotes. And yeah, um, I think the explanation and the examples um, were great there. So, so um, not a secret that I've got a background in product management as well. So a little bit biased towards uh, the product manager's perspective on things. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story. So Edwin and I met, I think, two years, two, three years ago. I think it was during um, lockdown. We met on an online course where, you know, everyone was trapped in their, their homes and couldn't go anywhere. So I think we <laughs> thought, why not talk to some strangers on Slack during a uh, during lockdown? Um, and um, at that point, you were working in, you were already in New York, but but in recruitment role, I think most people would think recruitment career to a product career, um, not obvious changes, not obvious pivots. Maybe describe what was that aha moment that you wanted to change? And then I think, yeah, we would be fascinated to hear like, what was that, that, that process that, um, that, that you found to, to do that pivot? Absolutely. So... Some of the aspects I enjoyed about recruitment was getting to partner with startups at a really early stage in their development, getting to meet with founders of companies that went on to be incredibly successful in some cases and cease to exist in others because that's the, the startup roller coaster, but getting to see inside those companies and learning about their culture, learning about the problems they were solving and learning how can I go to an engineer at Google and convince them to pack that in and go join a company that doesn't even have a landing page yet. That was such an interesting set of challenges to solve. And because I was recruiting technologists, I had this assumption that I should learn about technology. And what I started doing was learning to code. And I thought that basically there was a different spread of outcomes here. There might be a best case scenario where I enjoy writing software so much I become a software engineer. But even if I didn't achieve that, I was betting it would make me better at talking to software engineers. So at the very least, I would have, be, have more understanding about their discipline, which in theory should make me a better recruiter. Now, I actually learned that you hit the point of diminishing returns there very quickly. The effort into learning something hard, like learning to code, versus 
it's giving you better rapport as a recruiter. It does make you better, but the juice might not be the sque worth the squeeze if that's your only objective. There are probably better ways to become a better recruiter than learn how to code. So you, I, I wouldn't recommend that as a mean, as a goal unto itself if you're a recruiter. But thankfully, I found it really interesting for its own sake. I found the idea of learning how software works, coding, building stuff, solving problems for myself, building things that I needed in my day-to-day -day life. And I was probably imagining what a pivot into software engineering would look like. Probably because that's a, it's a not an uncommon piece of content on the internet, right? Learn to code, how to become a software engineer. And if you're adjacent to technology or working for a startup, then that might seem like a pretty straightforward path. And I was sat in a meeting with my colleagues who were recruiters and one of them recruited product managers. And at this point, I had no idea what a product manager was. And she was explaining to us what a product manager did. And she pulled up this infographic that basically had kind of roughly equal splits between technology, design, communication, and business. And I just had this like light bulb moment that I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be surprisingly technical by the standards of a non-technical person. I want to make stuff, but I also want to have like business impact and solve problems. And from that point, I can get into the weeds on this if this, if this would be interesting. From that day to my first day as a product manager was a two year process. And so I don't want to sugarcoat this to anyone that this is something that you can do overnight, but if it might be interesting, I'd, I'd, I'd be happy to get tactical and start diving into what that what what that process out of recruitment and into product management look like. Yeah, I think I think it'd be great. Let's 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 pull that thread a little bit further then. So, because there was, I think, at least one role between between those pieces, like maybe to talk us through that realization or that experience of starting out that journey and what were the pitfalls and. And, and what were the learnings and, and you know, how did you uh, eventually arrive, you know, in, in the promised land? Absolutely. And I, I think my first bit of advice to anyone who's, whether it's product management or something else, is go and immerse yourself in that world. There's no shortage of people telling you what books to read to do these things. And so that is absolutely a starting point because understanding how the job is done in practice. And I actually think, my advice would be is like, go out and get books that are designed for people who already do the job. And it doesn't matter that some of it might not make sense. Just keep reading it. Like if you're, I remember reading a book called like user story mapping. That's like the second book I read about product management, which is like a tactical thing you do in the day to day as a product manager. I won't bore your audience with what it is. And Daniel and I, I'm sure could, uh, could, could go on about this for ages. But what it is doesn't matter. What was important was it didn't make sense to me. And I just started jumping around the book, like reading different parts of it. But it gave me an understanding of what the job feels like to do. It doesn't matter that this is like kind of an instruction manual for people who already know what they're doing. It actually gave me more of an insight than some of what we might call the high level kind of philosophical books about discipline that are kind of manifestos about how it ought to be done. I would say you want to strike a balance. You want to read some of those kind of manifesto style books, but you also want to read some cookbooks. You know, you also want to read some tactical books about doing the job. Um, and so in my case, books that helped me there was use story mapping, uh, continuous discovery habits by Teresa Torres, uh, and don't make me think, which is actually for designers, one product managers, but gave me like a really good understanding of the mechanics of design. And while I was doing this, I was naively applying to entry level product manager jobs. No one wanted to talk to me. And it's actually not that surprising because even though I was a recruiter and I made a living looking at people's resumes and going, they don't have enough experience for this job, I'm not going to talk to them. I perhaps wasn't quick enough to apply those, that tactic and level of understanding to my own job search. And so, and this is, I think, I hope this is, this is, this is, this is, this is valuable advice, but applying for jobs is easy because it's linear. You can write a nice list of 50 jobs and you can set yourself a task of doing 10 a day you can make a nice Trello board with all the different jobs. You can do some research on the company. You can tailor your resume to each one and chuck it in to the mix. And it feels like you're doing something, but it's just an output, not an outcome. The outcome is booking interviews, talking to companies, getting, getting introduced to companies. But when you are very fixated on like changing something in your life, it feels like you have to start doing something from day one. But really, for a lot of folks, and this is true of me, I was wasting my time applying to these jobs. 
because I wasn't differentiated at all. There's no shortage of people who would like to be product managers. And the fact that I could code a bit didn't differentiate me against people who are software engineers with three years experience wanting to pivot into product. And so I can code was the wrong thing to try and differentiate myself on because I was already on the back foot. In this discipline, a very common path is become a software engineer, then pivot into product management. And so if I'm selling myself as I can code, I'm way below the actual people who've like written production level code for three years. And I didn't even come to this realization myself. Someone helped me. And so a recruiter at a company that had rejected me. As ever, every time I got rejected, I asked for some feedback. And to her enormous credit, she gave me some feedback. And she said, you're underqualified. Now, this is for an associate product manager job. This is the entry level job. And I had five or six years experience in the working world. I could code. And I was underqualified. And when I pushed back, she, yeah, she said, look, you don't have a computer science degree. Like, it doesn't matter that you've taken one computer science class online. You're still underqualified even compared to a graduate. And her candor here was such a gift. Like, radical feedback like that to someone that she had no skin in the game to engage with completely changed my mindset and how I thought about it. And so I then started thinking not what do I want, which is to become a product manager, but like who has done this successfully? So I went on LinkedIn and then I started looking at companies I admired for product managers who worked there who didn't have technical backgrounds to try and pull out the themes. And again, anyone can do this. This is free. You can just like go on LinkedIn, which is like a phenomenal repository of career histories of people who've done the job you want. And yeah, I would suggest do what I did and reach out to some of these people and ask for advice. But even if you don't do that, just by looking at the profiles, you can start to pattern match and pull out what people have done. And so the first thing that I noticed was a lot of them had MBAs. So I thought that's potentially one path, do an MBA. But then I noticed this second class of profile where people would join a startup in some other role and then have a role internally as a product manager afterwards. So people who join in customer success, people who join in sales, marketing. And when I weighed these two choices up against each other, one, you get saddled with debt. The other, you get paid. So that seemed like a pretty, if I'm gonna learn to do something, I'll take the option where I get paid to learn the thing rather than the option where I pay to learn the thing. And so I started trying to identify startups where I thought I would have an unfair advantage to join in any role in the company. And here's how I thought about that. I was a recruiter. And so I thought, what companies would my knowledge of recruitment be an unfair advantage? And what I landed on was companies who sell to HR and talent teams. So companies who make software, B2B software, that is sold to other companies, where the person using the software, their customer, is someone who is a recruiter or something like a recruiter. And I thought that I'd have this unfair advantage because I've used some of this software myself. And at the top of this, we talked about user empathy, talking to your customers, understanding what their, their, their wants and needs. And so I targeted companies that were in this HR tech space. And I ended up getting a role in partnerships. Um, funny story about this as well. This is kind of an example of the luck you get when you're rigorous. My current company, Omnipresent, I'd identified them as a rapidly growing HR tech company, really admired them. And I was going to like DM the founder and shoot my shot for like a, like, like a job there. And in doing that, I was researching the company. There were like 27 people at this point. This, um, this is um, just before their series A. Um, and in doing that, one of them saw me look at their profile and reached out to me about a partnership with my current company. And during that call, I, they, they actually head on to me and said, no, you should come work here. And so all of this organic looked like it happened by accident, but was a direct result of the effort I put in doing my due diligence to look at, look at everyone at this company. And as it happened, what they wanted more than anything right then was not a product manager, although I shot my shot for that, but of course they said no. What they wanted more than anything was someone to join their partnerships team who understood recruitment. And so I kind of found myself right in this sweet spot if they wanted, which is someone who knows about recruitment, who doesn't want to be a recruiter, who can join in partnerships. And once I was in, I made it my absolute mission to add value in my current role because I knew I wouldn't be eligible to pivot 
internally unless I was exceptional at the job they actually hired me to do. And that was how that's that, that's how I then approached that from day one. I love Amazing that story. story Edmund. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've got I've got an admission to make, uh, Edmund. I actually use you as uh, as an example of your story or that that approach, that exact approach. Um, I didn't know that you'd done all of those steps, but that is basically the approach that I tell people to do. It's like you need to say identify the people and the companies that you want to work in, reach out to them, ask them, you know, for an online coffee or a, you know, a, you know, a, a real coffee if they're if they're if they're near you geographically. But yeah, so um, it's great to catch one out in the wild, so to speak, um, of someone that's done that methodology, thought really um, uh, analytically about the problem and how to solve it. And yeah, and uh, congratulations on making success of it. There's something I should flag as well, and I didn't admit this by, on, on purpose, it. but <laughs> to, for the mate, that, I'm not used to telling this story in such detail, right? Most people <laughs> don't care to the extent that you guys care. So this is this is awesome. Here's something that it would be wildly irresponsible of me not to mention. In this two-year process of wanting to become a product manager, before I, you know, the, of these two years I've just talked about, the first year was I was trying to gain the skills. The second year was I was inside a startup trying to pivot internally. In that first year, I was working full-time as a recruiter. I reached out to startups who were advertising part-time product manager jobs and offered my services as like an intern. Not instead of my full-time recruitment job, in addition to. And so for six months of that year, I was working full-time as a recruiter. I, there was a YC-backed startup that was in the ed tech space, and they taught students about the business world. And I had a role there as a program manager, part-time, teaching classes to students in the evenings. Once I was there doing that, so that's maybe an extra 10 hours a week on top of my full-time job. On my first day at that company, I DM'd the one product manager at this startup, told him exactly what I intended to do, which is become a product manager, asked him what laborious product manager tasks he had that he'd like to give away to me in exchange for some mentorship, and made it clear that I wasn't going to get paid for those bits. I'd get paid for the classes I was teaching, because that was, that was the agreement, but that I would take on in addition to that some part-time work. So now I'm working full-time as a recruiter, 10 hours a week teaching the classes to allow me to work 10 hours for free, essentially as an entry-level product manager. And I did that for six months. And that meant that when I was pivoting internally at Omnipresent, I suddenly had two unfair advantages. I actually had done work as a product manager and so was overqualified qualified for an entry-level job. And I had knowledge of the company and the customer having worked there for a year. And I tell that story to say like, I didn't just pay someone for a four week course and become a product manager overnight. I had to have high conviction that if I bet on giving my time, my additional leisure time for free to a company in order to gain skills, I couldn't lose because either I would love it and would find incredibly fulfilling and would be even more reassured that I wanted to do it. Or if you do it for free and you hate it, well, then you shouldn't do it. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> If you're committing your evenings and weekends to doing something and you don't find any enjoyment for its own sake for a time limited period, right? You're saying to your head, I'm going to do this for three months, six months, whatever, then don't do it. Because if you don't have some intrinsic motivation, some intrinsic joy out of the task, then it's probably not going to be a career that you find fulfilling. I think that's such well, a great point is a lot of people just pick something like, oh, wouldn't it be fun to do this job? but they don't know, especially early on, but they don't know what it actually takes to do that job. So doing something part-time, doing something as a volunteer gives you that experience and then can open your eyes to whether or not I actually like this. Because to your point, if I don't like it in this small capacity, I probably don't want to be doing it all of the time. I also like cool. how you your story shows leveraging the background that you had because i think in a career pivot a lot of people think they have to shed everything that they studied before or every who they were before and really make this full 180 transformation but your story is building off and using who you were before as a recruiter as a value add into the job that you want so you're just adding on extra skills making yourself more marketable 
you're not saying, well, that's who I was. I don't want to do anything about that anymore. Now I want to be this, right? You're bridging it all together. Yeah, you've got to recycle it. You, otherwise, you're leaving value on the table. You've got to recycle your story because you're telling, and like, obviously, Lisa and Dale know this because they're like resume writing experts. And I absolutely love the episode about, about resumes as a former recruiter as well, uh, who, who, you know, recruiters have spicy opinions about resumes. So uh, <laughs> it was amazing that I just nodded along to everything. Um, you're telling a story with your resume and you're telling a story whereby it makes sense that the next chapter is the job you're applying for. And so you, there needs to be a consistent through line and only you know how to tell that story. So for example, here's how I told the story. When I was interviewing for, for, for product manager jobs, I said, one of the core competencies of a product manager, I imagine from the research I've done is getting buy-in from software engineers. You're on a team of four to eight software engineers. There's one of you, you're not their boss, but you're all trying to pull together. Influencing software engineers without authority is one of the core components of being a tech recruiter. You try telling someone on a million dollars total comp at Twitter mm -hmm. that they're negotiating their salary wrong and you need to do it for them. That is absolutely a way to build up understanding and empathy for engineers by having spoken to maybe about 10,000 of them <laughs> by some means over my career. And it's true, I have an unfair advantage of product manager I have this empathy because once you listen to thousands of engineers tell you why they hate their job and they want to leave it because no one talks to a recruiter when they love their job, you internalize it and you get a real good idea of what the anti-patterns are and what you should avoid doing in inter interactions with them. And only you can look at your previous career history and pull out those threads of what could make sense. But the most straightforward and tactical thing is, in my previous job, what software did I use? What, who are companies that make that software or that kind of software? And if you really want to, like, as a product manager, if you want to start, like, thinking like a product manager, look at the tools that you use on a daily basis. Identify things where you don't love it, some real pain point you have. Not like a abstracted, wouldn't it be cool if it did this, but some actual thing that you have. And then just give it to them as feedback. They'll have, like, a button somewhere on the product to, like, give feedback. The person who responds to that is probably going to be a product manager. Um, and it helps you starting to think about it and also seeing how like product managers interact with users. Any company will probably be sending out surveys for doing user interviews. Say yes to them because by being interviewed by a UX researcher or a product manager as a user, you'll start to understand that process. Any opportunity you can have to like interact with people doing the job you want and seeing how they do it is is, is accessible if you're a user of tools. And so just like use more software, like download stuff, apps that you think would look interesting, take free trials and stuff in your, in your regular job. Do it with startups because they're going to be more amenable to talking to you because they need that early user feedback to like build out a picture of like how people who build software. Speaking of technologies and how they change, <laughs> I have a question for you about AI and would love to hear how you see AI impacting either your job or industry, and if there are any ways you're using it at the moment. Um, okay, so I, I went to like a meetup about ChatGPT like a week after it came out, so like December um, 22, wasn't it? Yeah, so um, take that out in post if it was actually 2023, but top of my head is 2022. <laughs> um, <laughs> And one of the things that I love about living in New York or like a major city with like a big tech hub is that you get to surround yourself with other people who are excited about nascent things. And being in a room around people who are already like hacking stuff together with it broadened my horizons to like what this tool could do. And I think, interestingly, now I don't think this is true for all jobs. I think there are some jobs that should be like legitimately worried about the viability of being a human learning to do that thing. But in the case of product management, I don't think AI will replace product managers because I don't think most product managers are systematic enough at their job to be automated away. So I actually think most product managers are so slapdash in their thinking, or in many cases, don't apply a level of rigor that actually there's less opportunity for them to be automated away but I think for good product managers, AI will be a massive multiplier on how effective they are. So I actually think if you're talking to users, 
AI is a huge unfair advantage because what is an LLM like ChatGPT good at? It is good at synthesizing massive amounts of text and abstracting it away into themes. So here's something I do. When I talk to users, we record our calls because we're remote. So I have transcripts of the user's call, of course, with their permission, don't record users if they don't know you're doing it. And after those calls, I can take five of those calls and apply an LLM to them. But where, where, where there's a kind of secret source in, in, in GPT is like, it can read and comprehend something and then read and comprehend something else. So I can give it a blog written by Teresa Torres about how to analyze user interviews. And I can say, read this article and then apply the framework from that article to these five transcripts of calls I had. Create a tabulated form of the pain points, the needs, the desires, include a verbatim quote from it, give it to me as a spreadsheet. And if you are talking to your customers regularly, that is a huge unfair advantage. If, however, as a product manager, the reason you build stuff is because your boss told you to build it, then there's not really an opportunity for, for high impact by using AI. So I actually think that there'll be a, that product management will become quite bimodal. There will be a class of product managers who are like waiters and order takers from executives who project manage stuff through little cards in some kind of software. And actually they won't feel the benefit of AI. They won't be automated away because a lot of their value is politics and obfuscation of information. But then there'll be a class of user obsessed product managers who have massive impact and like massive leverage because they are able to take 10,000 customer emails and pull out insights from them instantaneously and have them having them for live. And it's still up to them what to do with that information. And it's still up to them to synthesize it into a cohesive plan of what to build. But the distinction of like, are you data informed or user led, I think will kind of be, be dissolved because it'll be both. You can actually be user led with a volume of data that can be synthesized for you. Cause no one, no human can sit down and read 10,000 emails, but an LLM absolutely. And I think the future of product management where today PMs might write SQL queries to query data in the future, they'll be writing SQL queries to query users as well. All everything will be recorded. All sales calls will be recorded. You'll have transcripts. You'll have this like ocean of information to dip into. And the skill will be thinking of the right questions to ask, which today is the, the skill that you need to interview one user. Now you'll be able to do it and query all your users or all your touch points and interactions with your users. And that's where I see the opportunity of AI in, in, in product management is to become more informed about what is really happening in the world and how the customer is feeling, thinking, interacting with your product and using that to make sure you're building the right thing. But the PMs who don't have a posture of, I don't know, I need to find out how the user feels, won't feel that benefit. They won't be abstracted away, but they, there will be a ceiling of their, their, their output. So how are you balancing your work, other things in your life? So I have a 10 month old son um, and this is my, my first kid becoming a parent is fantastic. It's also a forcing function to be very disciplined with the time when you're not working because all of a sudden every minute after the end of your working day has this huge opportunity cost where you can be interacting with this, a, a baby who would like get so much value from their interactions with you. And I'm incredibly grateful to be at a company that really lives its values of like giving people space to be parents. And I actually came off six months of parental leave after my, the birth of my son, which was fantastic. And so one of the answers to the question there, and this isn't that helpful if you don't work at a company that has that good a policy is being able to like focus on family at the most critical time to like make sure that when you come back to work, you can actually bring your best self to work. Um, and so I've, I've, I've experienced this fantastic opportunity to like really dive into fatherhood for the first six months, um, and then come back to come, come back to work subsequently. Um, I think the way I, the way I think about it really is like in terms of balancing work with your personal life. And again, considering an audience who might be earlier in their careers, I think it's about knowing when to push. It's not about having an arbitrary constraint in your head of how much work you do and when your leisure time starts and when your work ends. It's about knowing when is there a high impact opportunity to push myself and how, what benefit will they have? And the heuristic I would use for this is 
Can I put this on my resume? For instance, when an opportunity presents itself to like push yourself and do more work that might be expected of you, is this something you can talk about for the rest of your career that has high impact? No one ever talked in a job interview about how they made some slides for an executive at 11 p.m. It's meaningless. However, people have talked in interviews about how a customer experienced a bug at 11 p.m. and they jumped on a call with them to troubleshoot it and stop the customer from churning. And so I think you should view your non-working time as a bet you make. And there are high impact opportunities to make a bet to have like massive upside and impact on your career. And any arbitrary restriction of like, it's X times, so I'm not going to do Y, I actually don't think is that valuable and helpful. Um, I used to work on commission in recruitment. And so it literally had opportunity costs not working. And... I remember I had a candidate who was in China and a client who was in San Francisco and I was in London. And to put this deal together, it required staying up all night because there was back and forth across multiple different time zones and some time pressure because the candidate had an offer elsewhere. And I was literally remunerated for that. And so it wouldn't have made any sense. No one was telling me I had to do this, do this, but for like, for, for my own career impact, there, there was absolutely skin in the game to do so. And for anyone who does get some message from an executive about making some slides at 11 p.m., my absolute pro tip would be ask some clarifying questions and you'll be amazed how rarely they respond to you that night. <laughs> so when you get some DM about something that is so urgent, ask some common sense clarifying questions about the task because if they do respond then you know it is urgent and maybe you should do it and if they don't well it can wait and you'll be amazed how commonly that gets folks off you off your back because really that executive has probably just had their boss come tell them to do it urgently and they're kicking it down the can to you so if you ask them some clarifying questions they probably don't know the answer and they have to go ask someone and they're not going to message their boss at 11 p.m so anyway that's a pro tip i'm not saying work at 11 p.m by default i am saying be cognizant of the leverage of the bets you can take with your ledger time at certain opportunities. That is wonderful advice uh, that you are imparting on our audience. So now I would like you to think back on some advice you've received over the years. And do you have any best or worst career advice that you have received throughout your career? Yes. Yeah, so the best career advice I've ever had, and maybe you can put this video in the show notes, um, is someone that Dale and I both admire, which is Scott Galloway. And he has this fantastic piece of advice, which is, I'm going to distill it, but go away, watch the video. It's only like two minutes long. Don't do what you're passionate about, do what you're good at. And the kind of rationale behind that is mastery of something becomes your passion. Picking something that you have like natural aptitude for and becoming exceptional at it, you get passionate about it. And yeah, I watched the video. I think he talks about um, tax accountants, that the world's greatest tax accountant is not passionate about tax. They are passionate about the lifestyle that they've created for themselves by being the world's best tax, tax accountant. And also, the things you're passionate about, you don't actually get to do them full time when you do that. I was incredibly interested in theater directing earlier in my my life. I spent much of my time at university directing plays. And then I realized that the life of a professional theatre director is you direct one show for two to three weeks, and then that's it. And then you have to go be a drama teacher or work in a pub or work in a cafe. And for me, the value, the exchange of value of like doing something I love for like three weeks of every six months to then do something I hate for the rest of it didn't, didn't line up. And so I think the idea of identifying where you have uncommon aptitude for something and then becoming world-class at that, rather than thinking about what you're passionate about, because what you're passionate about as a leisure activity, if you like playing a musical instrument, maybe you don't like playing that for 12 hours a day. Practicing the craft isn't doing the craft in most cases. And the practicing is probably feels like toil if it's not something you're completely fired up about. Um, so yeah, that would be, I, yeah, I'll see if we could, I'll, I'll send you the link, maybe you can put it in the show notes. But that, that advice I think has really, really shaped my, my, my approach to, to my career. Can you give us uh, some, you've mentioned one writer already, uh, Scott Galloway, and I think a couple of others um, were dropped in Teresa Torres, but um, do you want to give us some more specific book and or podcast recommendations, please? 
Absolutely. So podcast, if you're interested in product management, Lenny's podcast is definitely the foremost authority on product and, and building um, building software. If you're more interested in like startups in general, uh, First Round Capital do a fantastic podcast called In Depth that really gets tactical with startup founders about the early days of their companies. And reading the book I recommend more than anything to, to anyone is Naked Statistics by Charles Whelan. It's a really accessible and interesting dive into data statistics and like making decisions with data, which I, I highly recommend. And adding on to that, anything you would like to pitch to our audience, anything you would like some insights on or any feedback they can share with us that we can pass on to you. So I'm obsessed with the intersection of talent and technology. And I'd be so curious to hear from your audience, for those who are on the job search, how, what exceptional recruitment have they experienced? Have they interviewed with a company that had a really slick interview process? Have they interviewed somewhere they had a really novel and interesting piece of technology involved in the interviews? Or maybe they even just had a really, really elegant way of um, rejecting someone or giving a good human touch, even, even if you weren't hired. Come DM me on LinkedIn, because like anything like that about the, the experience of how companies are using technology in novel ways to recruit great people, I'm absolutely obsessed with. And I'd love to hear what you're experiencing out there in the market. Awesome. Amazing. Um, I think that brings us to the end, Edmund. Um, thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we, we mentioned uh, before coming online that, um, yeah, I think you brought a little bit of youth and vigor to, um, to our, to our uh, guest lineup. Uh, and so having done that transition so recently, I think it's great to have like someone that's really methodically thought about um, their career and how to improve it and has followed through and actually made it all happen, I think is really inspiring. So thank you for sharing all of those details and, and those little tactics and, and the methodology and approach you did there. I think it's been amazing. And uh, yeah, and, and lots of great advice for, for the audience out there. Fantastic. Had a brilliant time. Yeah. And looking forward to anyone who's curious about this topic, come, come find me on LinkedIn and I would love to love to dive into it. So Lisa, another one in the can. What are your reflections? I have several reflections. I love how Edmund was able to pivot, change, take his interests, change into something else and give us all of those details of what it actually took and how much time he invested, even as a recruiter. So he came in knowing the process, but still had to put in the work to be able to make that pivot. Uh, and he seemed to really enjoy the process, right? And that maybe not the rejections, but he kept his motivation going, which I think shows he really is in the job that he loves. You could tell when he was describing what a product manager does that he has found his spot where he is really excited by his work. So I always love to see that. What about you? Yeah. 100% agree with all of that. And say, from a personal perspective, really great to see that Fredman, like, personal life, professional life, really humming together and, and complimenting each other and say he's got a, got a very um, understanding and uh, accommodating employer. So, you know, that's the standard I think we should be all aspiring to is find an employer that we, A, like working for and also that they take care in our, in our base interests as well. Um, yeah, all the sharing of that, say, if you're trying to change job or you're looking for a new job, that start of that process really can be hard. Um, but that realization, if you aren't getting those interviews, you aren't getting the, that first outcome that you need, that first step in, in that change, then you need to take a step back, reflect on that, do some sort of internal analysis or analysis about the problem that you're trying to solve and pivot. And um, yeah, you may not need to go to the to the lengths and have the level of commitment of taking a second job on for six months as Edmund did, but you can see that that effort um, was valuable as he described in and out of itself. But and allowed him to figure out whether he was going to like this new job or not. A great sort of experiment to to do up front, but also gave him that outsized. Um, value that sort of step up that unfair advantage if you like compared to other job seekers that might be going for the same job or applying to the same companies um, and that methodology of finding 
companies or opportunities where you've got an unfair advantage because of your previous experience. In his case, he was a recruiter. Or why not go to HR, HR software companies? Brilliant idea. Also reaching out to people and creating those serendipitous moments or, you know, that maybe aren't so serendipitous, but you've sort of, you've, you've um, created them. Um, yeah, is is definitely the methodology that if you if you're trying to do a career move like that, I, I wholeheartedly recommend. Yeah, he gave us the story behind the story because if we look at mm. his profile online, it would look like he transitioned directly from one job into the other, right? And someone maybe reached out to him, but he gave us all of that extra info that you really only get from talking to somebody. So another plug for reaching out and having conversations and learning the real story. We're not going to see everything if we don't do that. Yeah, and I think we are going to do an uh, a episode um, between you and me, Lisa, about uh, advising people how they can start that process, some of the tactics, maybe how to look for people, how to reach out to them. Um, so if you want to see that sooner rather than later, so get in the comments, guys, um, or drop us a line. Um, I think it might be time to sign us off, Lisa. Yeah, so we have made it to the end of the podcast which we hope means you found it interesting, entertaining, and possibly even valuable. I know you did. If so, go ahead and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube and follow us on Instagram and TikTok. Even better, if you want to unleash your potential and get the career that you want, you can visit Career Badger for a bunch of free resources that we described at the top of the show. Um, or even better, download the mobile app for iPhone and get real human career coaching from Lisa. That's it from us. See you next time.